This production is brought to you by the University of Edinburgh. Just to wrap some of this up, so this is kind of just an overview of everything. So a system represents a mechanical device, an electrical circuit, it could be a computer processor, it could be a DSP. Essentially, a system describes the behavior of a physical system. So a system can exist with, with no signals going through it. Uh, a signal is an input to the system and there's also an output. Uh, to describe a system, so this is property of a system, you look at its frequency response. We've already discussed that in detail. The question is, how do you get a frequency response? A system is characterized by two, two well-known things. Uh, the, imp the frequency response, h of j omega. That's the ratio of the output of a signal to the input of a signal at a particular frequency, at the frequency omega. And it turns out that that is a Fourier transform of something called an impulse response. So I think you might come across impulses in maths but we're going to look at impulse responses. But to, to be honest, we're going to look at the characteristics of systems in the third year. The second year is going to be mainly focused on signal analysis. But I might keep mentioning systems and outline just to try and keep putting things in context. What we're going to do in the second year is learn about this Fourier transform. And then in the third year, you'll be applying that a lot more. You can also, something that you'll do in the third year, is something called convolution. So there's a way of working out the output of a system in the time domain, given the input in the time domain, and that's going to be sort of important as well. Okay, so uh, I think this diagram is quite important for thinking about what we're going to do with signal analysis. So, yep, go on. Right, so it's a, it's a very good question for when we do a Fourier transform. So the Fourier transform models non-periodic signals. And we're going to see that, in fact, the Fourier transform assumes that you have a signal. It's called the signal H of T, just, just because it's on the slide, that exists for all time, from T is minus infinity to plus infinity. It's a mathematical idealization. And effectively, you're saying the signal has an infinite period. In what we're going to do, not, not next week, the week, probably a week after, is to derive the Fourier transform from the Fourier series by allowing the period of a Fourier series to grow to infinity. So you've got yourself in a bit of a, a conundrum here, because we have speech. Clearly, I'm not going to be talking forever. It might seem like it sometimes. But I'm not going to be talking until t equals infinity. So whilst I've got a signal that has no period, Equally, it doesn't make sense to try and model speech that lasts for all time. So this is a, an issue which we'll cover briefly at the end of the course, but you'll do, you'll do more in the fourth year. But you essentially have it, you end up having to window data and look at the effect of windowing on the signal. So it's all an idealization, the, the way that Fourier transforms work. There are other transform methods out there which get around some of these problems. So I think really the issue is that speech is, is time varying and always time varying. The characteristics of a speech signal at one day is different to the, you know, well, depends what you're saying, but well, characteristic speech from one second to the next can be effectively completely different. So trying to model a whole speech signal simultaneously does not necessarily make sense. So there is something called a short time Fourier transform, which breaks the signal up into shorter segments and you try and analyze the instantaneous frequency content. So the, these are exactly the questions you want to be thinking about from the start. So if you take a speech signal and I took the Fourier transform over as much data as I can get and you come out with a dominant frequency. That dominant frequency might be about 500 hertz which would correspond to roughly where the pitch of a signal is. That dominant frequency is not necessarily the instantaneous pitch of a signal. It's effectively sort of pitch averaged over a very long period of time. So there is a sort of conceptual difference between the frequency analysis that a 
Fourier transform gives you and the concept of an instantaneous frequency. What's the instantaneous frequency of a pitch of my voice? Because it's obviously been changing. This is time frequency analysis, which is really good. Sounds like I should try and give a demo of time frequency analysis. We won't cover that in a second year, because we need to get through the basics first. I don't know if that answers your question, but I hope that helps. So on the left-hand side, I've got a simple periodic signal, which is composed of two sinusoids at two different frequencies. Uh, these frequencies are in radians per second, and they've got different amplitudes. Uh, so far, you're used to plotting signals on oscilloscopes. And the oscilloscopes are analog scopes, they're non-storage scopes, they just sort of produce the signal that you're seeing, and you let the eye do the interpretation. Now the question is, is that a good representation of a signal? Now we're engineers, so engineers live in a time domain world. We view things as a time, in, in, in time domain. But just imagine that you were an alien, and in fact you just lived up on the observatory hill, and you're an astronomer, so apologies to anyone who likes astronomy. But if you're a physicist or astronomer, you're more likely to be living in a frequency domain world. When astronomers do observations of, of stars they're, and pulsars, they're looking for frequency content. They're looking for Doppler shift information. They're doing all sorts of things. But they're basically living in a frequency domain world. Now, we're often used to living in the time domain. But as engineers, we're going to make that transition today. And that's simply, if you took the Fourier transform of a signal, or even the Fourier series, and I plotted, rather than against time, I plotted against frequency, uh, I get two, now these are two spikes, and actually two what we're going to call impulses, and the, the position of those impulses are the frequencies of those two sinusoids. Now notice that in this domain, the signal is quite sparse. What I mean by sparse is that the frequency content is zero everywhere, if I looked at all possible frequency values, apart from at four points, and in fact two of those points are just uh, symmetric values of the other two. Whereas in the time domain, the signal doesn't look sparse, it's going on forever and ever. So if you had to record this signal, which one would you rather record? Think about, also, if you wanted to transmit this signal, yeah, you want to record the right-hand side one. And that's because you've only got to communicate four values. Right, the four values, because this is a symmetric spectrum, of the two frequencies and the two amplitudes of those frequencies. Four values. You could transmit that using, I don't know, uh, four double floating point numbers. If you had to transmit the signal on the left-hand side, and imagine it's continuous, how on earth do you transmit that? You can transmit it, but you'll be transmitting for all time. And so that's a very inefficient way. So that's another reason we're going to look in the frequency domain world, is often signals in one domain can be much simpler represented in a different domain, and that will allow us to do things that we possibly couldn't do before. And just to wrap up, the, the slides that I missed out earlier um, just relates to sampling. So um, what we do at the end of this course is to sample a signal, as you've got there. The question is, how fast do you sample? I've already mentioned that in a previous lecture. And also quantization. So you get quantization because of the electronic sampling process, because of analog to digital conversion. I'm not going to cover quantization this year. Other people, I'm sure, will. But it is an issue, so you do need to remember that. OK, so that's basically note that that's me finishing an overview of signals and communications. If you have a look at handout two, you'll notice that the mathematics begins almost straight away. So we'll do that next Tuesday. This production is copyright, the University of Edinburgh.